As, as, as always, appreciate you guys joining us today. Um, short week, you know, we had to get this thing turned around pretty quickly. Um, today is the equivalent of a Wednesday practice for us. And so, um, you know, our guys got in Sunday. Uh, we practiced Sunday night, uh, which was a Monday practice. And then yesterday, Tuesday, today, obviously Wednesday. Um, uh, we're well past looking back. You know, the Charlotte game, the thing I would say in reference to that game is that obviously, you know, the things we needed to do to win the game were necessary, but they won't be sufficient. And, and what I mean by that is that, you know, we did some things, we showed character, we overcame adversity, uh, all things that are necessary, but they won't be sufficient for us to be able to get the type of wins and go to where we want to go as a team. And so um, we put the Charlotte game behind us pretty quickly. Uh, it was good to see our guys respond the right way. Um, obviously, Virginia is a familiar foe, um, a former ACC rival. Um, having been here at Maryland for over 15 seasons and been a part of some of those games, they're, they're, they're important games for us. And if you look at the type of scheduling we've tried to do, this, this game is in great alignment with um, how I'd like to see us schedule. Um, obviously, being in the Big Ten is a tough enough conference, but we do have some historical rivals that are always great for our fans um, to have the opportunity to compete against. And Virginia is one of them. And I know our fans are pretty passionate about uh, that rivalry. Um, going into this game, I'm looking for us to clean up some of the mistakes that showed up early. You know, we're a team that operates better when we play with great pace, when we start fast. And uh, a week ago, we didn't. And so we want to try to get that corrected. And uh, we want to focus on coming out with the right type of energy and the right type of enthusiasm uh, Friday night here in the shell. And, and again, I'm hoping that we can we have an electric environment that our uh, players can can feed off of uh, that that extra element of, of having a, a a, a loud crowd here supporting us. Um, Friday night gives us another opportunity to continue our quest to show that we, we, we're we not the same old Maryland. And I know our players are excited uh, once again to be able to play uh, in front of a national TV audience here at home. And it uh, again uh, puts the university at the forefront uh, where everyone across the country has an opportunity to see just what a great place we have here um, in the DMV. Um, our game captains this week, Emilio Moran, uh, Kobe Thomas and Tarheeb still will lead us. And with that, I'll open it up for any questions. Good afternoon, Mike. Uh, Anthony Calandrea, their freshman quarterback in his first start last Saturday through for almost 400 yards. What have you guys seen on tape? What makes him special? Yeah, you know, he's a little bit like a young Leah. Um, he's one of those guys that extends plays. He's, you know, he, he can he continues to he doesn't give up on plays. You saw him make some big plays for them. Uh, obviously, a week ago, as a true freshman, to see what he was able to do was pretty impressive. Um, you know, Musket may be back, so we're kind of preparing for for both of those guys. Um, but I was really impressed with the true freshman out of uh, Florida with how he was able to come in and kind of provide a spark for them. Hey, Mike, a two-parter for you. The first. You mentioned a little bit in your opening remarks just the significance for you of renewing the rivalry in terms of the health and enthusiasm of college football in the DMV. And the second part is how, how well have you gotten to know Tony Elliott over the years and how would you kind of characterize the relationship given you both have been offense coordinators at high profile schools previously? Yeah, obviously, uh, the first one is the rivalry and, and what it means and the health of it. Well, you know, much like playing West Virginia, who, who's a longtime rival of, of, of the University of Maryland, uh, UVA is one of those games as well. And I know our fans get excited, especially when there are old ACC foes, to have the opportunity to compete against them. And I know we do it in some of our other sports here. Uh, so to be able to have this game on our schedule is something that, that I wanted, um, that, you know, obviously because of the proximity and because of the, some of the history behind this game. Um, as far as my relationship with Tony, I, I, I've gotten to know Tony really well. Obviously, my time at Alabama, him at Clemson, um, we got to know each other there. Uh, he won the Broyles Award the year before I won, so he was there to present it uh, to me. And then um, also had the opportunity um, you know, through the coalition, he was part of our first academy where we paired uh, qualified minority assistants with 
athletic directors across the country and uh, to, to mentor and Tony was part of that first academy and uh, hopefully the coalition in my opinion played a small role in, in, in helping prepare him for the opportunity he has now so a lot of respect for Tony and the program he has his offensive coordinator Des Kitchens is also a guy that has been part of the coalition and he's part of the academy that we have this year and so I've uh, been really impressed with the way he's managed his team through some of the tragedy they had a year ago and you know Tony's one of those all around good guys. Hey there coach, you What's talk up, about Charlotte? wanting that electric atmosphere, that electric environment. Do you notice a difference in the way your players play when you have a packed house and, and when they're hearing and feeding off those fans? You know, I don't notice it in the moment, but when you go back and we evaluate the game and I kind of evaluate how we started, um, uh, you, you get a feeling of the impact of what the crowd can have. You know, we try to prepare our team to not allow external things be the motivation behind it, but it sure feels good to run out um, in, in the first quarter and see a packed student section like we saw the first week. And, you know, I was impressed with the student section even through the, the pregame weather that we faced uh, this past weekend. And I'm hoping Friday night is one of those electric atmospheres which allows us to really put our best foot forward. Um, those things have more impact than the, the non-football things, recruiting uh, and, and those other areas. Uh, putting us at the forefront on national TV. So uh, it shows really well, and I'm hoping that we can, you know, have that type of crowd and that type of energy. Hey, Coach. What's um, up, Sean? Obviously, this, this rivalry, it's not like what it was before, but can you kind of think back for us and kind of give us some insight on, you know, when this rivalry was, was really cooking back in the day, what, what did it feel like the week of a UVA-Maryland game? Yeah, I mean, what were those games like? They, they were, you know, during my time, you know, I was here obviously as a youngster uh, out in the parking lots of uh, back then Bird Stadium when, when Virginia came into play, and it was always one of those games that it was competitive. Um, I can remember being here in, I want to say, 1999 when we had a chance. Uh, we were five and six, and we played them here at home. and. Uh, Lamont Jordan, I think, broke the record here, had over 300 yards rushing in a game. And, you know, we end up losing Billy McMullen catching the fade in the left corner of the end zone to, to win the game and end our bowl opportunities. And, uh, you know, I know when Coach Friedgen got here, being part of his staff, the hatred that he had for UVA was real. And, uh, you know, I haven't talked to him this week yet, but uh, I'm sure that he still, you know, gets pretty pumped up about it. So, you know, for me as a coach, uh, hearing Ralph talk about it obviously uh, showed me just how important a game it, it has been. And, and, and so I, I expected, you know, when I had a chance to put them on a schedule, it, I, it was something that I thought would be good for, for this area and for our program. Do you still feel that hatred? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a rivalry. I mean, I give it the respect that it deserves. I mean, there's been a lot of history, a lot of years of, the, of that game, and you know, I've got respect for those type of games. And there's no doubt that it's a it's still a rivalry, but more for our fans than it is for us because of us being part of the Big Ten now. Hey, Lox, uh, back here. <laughs> Bringing up those memories. Uh, I know we're getting to the point now where some of the players might not even barely remember Maryland of the ACC. Has there been a, some discussions this week about, hey, this means a lot to the fans? Like, how are you kind of relaying that to the players on this team about the rivalry? Yeah, because of the quick turnaround, I, I couldn't. I, I had to use my time wisely. And so for us, it's the next opponent. Um, we didn't put, you know, any more. Uh, things into the preparation. Now, as we finish up here, as we get closer to game time, you know, obviously, you know, we have meetings where we talk a little bit about the opponent and, you know, we had our scouting report stuff, which we tried to, again, because of how quick the turnaround was for us. But our players will understand it and I think they'll, they'll have a better feel for it uh, once the ball kicks off. And then one more for you real quick. I, I know you, you've mentioned a couple times, you always talk about the standard of starting fast. Is, is there a certain way you guys have emphasized that or are going to emphasize that in practice next week to prepare for a fast start this Friday? You know, being able to start fast goes back to our players and the consistency. You know, one of the things that jumped out to me is that some of the things that showed up uh, in, in, in our lack of a fast start showed up in practice a week ago. And so for the emphasis for us, you know, we talk about on the offensive side of the ball, one of the things I thought we struggled with uh, in the Charlotte game early was just getting lined up 
and trying to be able to play at the pace that we, we feel most comfortable playing at. And, you know, when you got guys not lined up at the right place and we're yelling from the sideline or the right people aren't in there, uh, those things are the things that kind of uh, slowed us down. And so we put an emphasis on uh, to be able to start fast. Usually simplicity needs to be part of it. And so, again, we want to simplify and make sure that we are very clear as to what it is we want to get accomplished in, in, in all three phases. And to me, that's what allows you to, to play fast. Oh, Mike, you know how productive you guys can be on the ground. Is there a sense of maybe relying on the ground game to help settle the offense in the early stages of the game? Again, you know, whether we run it or throw it, you know, we've shown efficiency at being able to do both at times. And I just think it comes back to um, being able to do both really well. Um, you know, we're not a guy, a team that from an identity standpoint that goes in and says, hey, we want to be a run team or we want to be a throw team. Uh, we want to be the team that does both of them really well. And when the defense presents certain structures, have that ability to take advantage of it. And, you know, we were able uh, last week, I thought, because of the tempo we started playing with after we kind of got going to wear down Charlotte a week ago. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean that it will be sufficient for us this week. And so the goal is for us to be good at both throwing the ball and running the ball and protecting the ball and creating explosive plays on offense. Hey, Mike. George, what's up? Not much. You were here the last time in 2013 when Maryland last played Virginia and you know fourth quarter comeback. Caleb threw for over 300 yards and everything. I, you've talked about your experience with the rivalry. I wonder for kids who now in an age of conference realignment 10 years on maybe don't necessarily have those same ties. Do you or anybody else kind of impart some words of wisdom to how much this meant to the program and to the fan base and to the area? You know what? You, t you generally do. But as I've said earlier, this, this turnaround was one. You play 730 at night. Uh, we obviously didn't play real well. I, I think I got to bed around 4 o'clock uh, Sunday morning just in time to wake up and go, go to church. And then, you know, it's getting this game put to bed by 3 o'clock and then game planning from 4 to 6.30 or whenever we had our team meeting to be ready for practice. So haven't had a lot of time to do the history of it, but what we're trying to do is clean up some of the things that showed up in game two for us to make sure our team's prepared to play really well. As I said, when we get closer to the the later part of our preparation, you know, the Friday before game is when we kind of have a motivational talk and I'm sure there'll be some, some things to explain just how important this game is to a, a lot of people. Um, this generation is not growing up on rivalries because of the realignment and it's just uh, where we are today in, in the landscape of college football. But we'll try to do our part to make sure our players understand that number one, is it is the next opponent, but this one is, is something pretty special to a lot of people. Mike, circling back on, on the run game a little bit, I know it's a small sample size, but Virginia's had some issues this year stopping the run. They're last in the ACC. You guys are able to crank it up against Charlotte. How much do those opponents factor into your game planning? It, it, it factors in. We look to see what the weaknesses are and try to attack them. Um, you know, but again, uh, they know what their fleas are as well. And, and much like us, we look to see when we self-scout what things we don't do well understanding that people are going to try to attack it. And so each week you work to improve in the areas that you, you aren't strong in. So I would, I would imagine they've been working on trying to stop the run game. For us, obviously, uh, to be able to do both is still optimal for how we want to play on offense. You know, uh, balance is not running at 50% uh, or throwing at 50%. It's being able to do both uh, very efficiently. And, and, you know, we still haven't had one of those games where they both have really tied together and hopefully we can put one together this week. Hey, Coach. What's uh, up, man? How are you? I'm good. So I've noticed that, especially in the secondary and the defensive line, you guys have kind of been versatile with the defense. I know Bo and Dante have kind of worked both in the box and out of the box, and then you guys have used a lot of guys in the interior and then over at tackle. Is that something you kind of focus on both in recruiting and then with the game plan? So the question you're asking is using the multiple players yeah, or is with, it multiple with the versatility schemes? of players. Is that something you focus on both in recruiting? Yeah, you have to. In this day and age, uh, you know, with people playing with tempo, especially on the defensive side of the ball, how it affects defenses. We saw a week ago uh, the effect our tempo had maybe on Charlotte in the second half. And, you know, you're good players. You want those guys playing really strong in the fourth quarter. And so, uh, you know, 
B Dub and the defensive staff has done a really good job of of rotating players. Um, you know, I, I'd be lying if I didn't tell you that. You know, the reason guys transfer typically is because they don't play, and, and so we try to find and create roles for all the players in our program, whether it be on special teams, offense, or defense. And so, um, and and because of the type of program we are, we're always trying to develop. And you don't develop your players on the bench. And so we try to find ways to create roles that allow each player to have some ownership in our program. And when we're able to do that, that's where I find us at our best. Hey, Coach. Good to see you. Um, I know that uh, going into the Charlotte game, you had mentioned the offensive line obviously wouldn't be playing as many players as they did in week one, but uh, I think there was eight different players that played this week. Um, but I guess kind of how would you assess kind of going into week three, how that unit's kind of gelling together a little bit? You know, coming along good, coming along as expected. Um, the more they play, the better they will be. Uh, we kind of made a change there at the center position and, and we continue to create competitiveness there which I think makes us better. I saw both Eric and Mike Purcell get better a week ago at the center position. Didn't play as many that we than we played obviously the, the way that game played out but we thought going into it we wanted to try to lock in and see what that unit looked like uh, playing consistently together. You know that's one of those groups that when you're substituting in there you don't necessarily get a good feel for the, the, the jail and how they complement each other. And so, you know, we're getting some guys back healthy this week and, and, and expect Gotti to be able to play for us. And that adds another element and, and gives us a chance to continue to evaluate. Hey, Coach, with it being a Friday game, does that change anything for you guys with regarding to recruiting just because players who might be able to visit now have their games to play? I mean, not really. I mean, we invite the kids. You know, this area we do have kids that maybe play on Saturday, and so those guys typically, you know, Friday night they want to be off their feet. Um, it, it it is what it is. Yeah. And then with um, Jayshon Barham, two sacks. Has there uh, ever been a p discussion with you guys about potentially moving him full time to being a edge rusher? No. 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 <laughs> yeah. Coach, um, w w one of the players stepping up in the in the secondary there is, is true freshman Alex Moore. Obviously, he was able to, to save that touchdown and kind of help force the interception there um, at the end against Charlotte. What, what have you seen from him so far and what sort of got him on the field so, so quick? Yeah, he was able to save a touchdown that he should have prevented the big play from happening, you know, and that's what we've seen is as a young player, he's shown spurts of being able to be a guy that we can count on, but he's going to have some, some, some mistakes that happen that just come along with being developed and you know, I would say he probably played better game one than he did game two. He got a little nicked up in game one. So it's really his first game playing banged up. And he's starting to learn that, you know, every week you got to bring the A game. But, you know, Alex, uh, you know, he's one of those guys, David Wingate. You know, I got to give, you know, Pilates, those two guys coming from Pilates have been impact freshmen for us. And it's been, I've been pleased to see the way those guys have uh, played for us. Hey, Coach. Uh, it seems like Caden Prather's kind of already become one of Talia's favorite targets. You've noted before kind of the downfield big play abilities he has. Uh, just what have you made of their connection so far, and what, is, you know, what does he provide for an offense as a deep threat? Yeah, I, I think Leah makes friends with all those receivers because they all know that if they want the ball, they, they, they want to make friends with him. Uh, Caden's no different. You know, Jay Sean Jones, I think, led us with seven targets. I think Caden had five. You know, much like on the defense, we try to be diverse with how we spread the ball around. Obviously, Caden's one of those guys that when we game plan, we say, hey, how can we get Caden involved to have a positive impact on the game because of the skill he has, and I think he's shown it uh, the last couple of weeks, and we're hoping that he continues to get better, and as the chemistry develops between him and the quarterback, uh, we'll see consistency in that, that big playability. Um, my question was a little similar to Varun's, but how does the short week kind of affect like game prep in general or getting the team ready? I think the biggest way it affects is that I don't get a lot of sleep, so I get a little cranky by the end of the week because, you know, burning both ends of the candle. Like I said, you know, a late Saturday night game, luckily for us, we didn't have to travel back. 
Um, we tried to let our players sleep in and we pushed everything back about an hour or two Sunday, which gave us a little more time as a staff to, to get the film graded, to get all the quality control reports done so we can put Charlotte to bed and then uh, proceed obviously into game planning. Fortunately, we have the type of staff or enough staff that we can do a lot of the prep work early. Um, so some of the younger coaches in our program maybe have maybe started on UVA, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, a week ago, um, just so that we could turn it around pretty quickly. Um, but for us, today's Wednesday. And I know all you guys are looking at me like I'm crazy because it's Tuesday, but this is Wednesday and, and our players are seeing it that way and Friday will be Saturday. So we try to uh, keep it consistent with our weekly prep and just know that the players lost the day of rest where they typically Sunday is their day off. They've, they'll go 13 straight days before they get a break, which will be this Saturday. Kind of building on that, um, do you like the change of pace of Friday night games or, or no. you, you much prefer the routine of much, Saturday? Um, I am a creature of habit as most coaches are. But I understand the, the, the benefit of it. So am I, do I like it? No. Do I understand the benefit of us playing on Friday night, national TV? Yeah. So the benefits outweigh maybe some of the, the things that it affects in terms of how we prepare. Yeah, uh, Coach, as someone who probably knows the Tangvaloa family as well as anybody, uh, Tua has developed into one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL right now, or certainly the hottest. Talk about Leah compared to his brother, similarities. Do you see the same kind of growth? Uh, just curious. Yeah, they're, they're two totally different personalities. I've been on the record as saying, you know, Tua is one of those guys that's a people pleaser. He's a guy that, you know, he's going to play really well when he knows that the people around him, you know, relationships are important. And not for Leah as if he doesn't care about relationships, but Leah is a whole different type of animal. Leah is a really emotional, uh, aggressive, uh, you know, I don't know if he, you know, he's not one of those guys that when he walks into the room that everything lights up. He's kind of one of those guys that comes into the room, figures out what he needs to do, gets it done, and then he's out. So uh, two dope, different personalities. But when you look at the quarterback play of those two, both really accurate passers, both great footwork, both have the ability to extend plays. I think Lee is maybe uh, able to scramble around a little bit better, maybe a little uh, extend plays a little better and become more of a runner. Whereas Tua is one of those guys that gets it out quick and he, he uh, extends plays in the pocket. Um, but the, the one common denominator is Nalu Tungavailoa, the dad who has raised both those guys to be quarterbacks. Uh, they had great foundational training at the position and, and you see both of them having great success wherever they've been. Thanks, guys.